Praise the Lord. Welcome to another broadcast of Atlantic Baptist Church, located at 1121 South Clay Street here in downtown Lowell, where the Reverend Robert L. Lyons is our senior pastor. Let us go to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this broadcast. We thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to stand before you. And proclaim your name as Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for all that you're doing for this ministry, for this church, for our pastor, our first lady, and our members. And God, we just thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon each and every one of us. We ask you to continue to lift us up, Lord, and continue to bless us, continue to provide for us, and know you will.
continue to give to us morning by morning the new mercies that are afforded us every day. And because of that, God, because you continue to bless us, we can say in the words of the psalmist, Psalm 34, that we will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in our mouths. In other words, God, have thine own way. Have thine own way, thou art the pot, I am the clay, mold me. Make me after thy will while we are waiting to the this field. God, in this service, have thine own way. God, in me and these your servants, have thine own way. God in this sermonic presentation, have thine own way. Fashion and form, these lips of clay to speak wonderful words of life to those who are listening, wonderful words of wisdom to those who would learn. And most importantly, and as always, the wonderful way of salvation to those who may be lost. And God will be careful to give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I know you're out in virtual land, but if you're just glad about this day that the Lord has given you, won't you uh, go just go ahead and type amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory be to God. For this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Amen. There is a word from the Lord on this day. Found in Luke chapter 6. Commencing in verse number 6. Luke chapter 6. Commencing in verse number 6. And I'll give you a moment to read. Uh, find that in your Bibles. We would have you read the whole chapter for very last context from which we shall attempt to preach due to the length of that text and the limitation on our time. We want to zoom in on Sonic Spotlight on commencing in verse number six. And it reads as follows. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and talked. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him but he knew their thoughts and he said to the man which had the withered hand rise up and stand forth in the midst and he arose and stood forth then said Jesus unto them I will ask you one thing is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking around upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored whole as the other. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Amen. Amen. And he stretched forth his hand and his hand was restored whole as the other. For the few moments that remain my own to tag this text and talk about what can't I handle? What can't I handle? And I ask that you would flank me with your prayers as I attempt to preach. What can't I handle? It was Robert Mendez Jr., born in 1988, with a disease called Tetra Amelia. This caused him to be born without arms or legs. Mendez has never had the privilege of knowing the uh, pleasure of brushing his teeth or combing his hair or feeding himself with a fork or spoon. He can't dress himself, 
bathe himself, or he can't even wipe himself uh, when he relieves himself. All the things we take for granted, down to wiping our own tears, Coach Mendez will never experience. And with all the things he cannot do, he lives by the motivational motto, who says I cannot? Who says I can't? This has driven him to do things no one else expected or imagined he would ever do, like being a head football coach, and always never had the joy of playing the game himself. As a matter of fact, while he's never held a ball, never thrown a ball, never caught a ball, it didn't stop him from playing ball every day with his dad when his father came home from work. I bring this up because this story of inspiration uh, gives me a number of points to ponder. I love Coach Mendez's passion and attitude for life and for coaching. It's both insatiable and contagious. And it's changed the mind and attitudes of coaches and administrations. It's changed the doubts and fears of players whom he's coached. And even most recently, he changed an auditorium full of players and coaches as he was awarded the Jim Valvano Award of Endurance, where he shared his motto once again, who says I can't? But now, since he's done something else that people said he could not and received an award at the ESPYs in front of every sports superstar on every level, he says, he says now of himself as a message to everybody else, who says I can't go further? Ladies and gentlemen, if this isn't the motto of every black born again believer, I don't know what it should be. This should be a daily mantra. Who says I can't? Or who says I can't go further? If you want to declare and decree something on this day, declare and decree there's nothing I can't handle, nothing I cannot do, nowhere I can't go, nothing I cannot achieve. And if you're real bad, if you're real bold, if you're black and Baptist, go ahead and add, you can't stop me and you can't block me, you can't hinder me, I'm on my way and you would do yourself a disservice uh, by getting in the way. Because I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I believe nothing is impossible with God. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a part of his amazing speech that arrested my attention. He ends it by thanking his Lord and his Savior Jesus Christ Watch this, for making everything possible. Yeah, listen, if you're not rolling with Jesus, if you're not sure that he's your rock, your sword, and shield, I want to give you just a couple of nuggets from this Nubian prince of Nazareth. And I don't have time to tell you everything, but I don't want you to leave without anything. So let me tell you two or three things Jesus does for us that will lead you to say, who says I can't? It's Sabbath day, it's church day, it's the day you go to worship, you learn about God in order to have a better fellowship and friendship with your Heavenly Father. And I'm not sure if Jesus was on the schedule that day 
uh, I don't know if it was his turn or he or if it was just open mic night and he grabbed the mic and ran with it. But the Bible says that he shows up to church with one individual itinerary item and then one thing on his itinerary was to teach. And what better teacher, what to teach us about God and the things of God than the Son of God? Who else is better qualified to share the Word than the Word Himself? Who else can articulate the story better than the author and the finisher of our faith? When Jesus shows up, when he arrives and stands up to teach, there's a brother in the audience who has a noticeable deformity. The Bible says his right hand is withered. This immediately led me to believe it was this brother's custom to be in church on church day. And what is immediately impressive and immediately imperant is he didn't let his paralyzed and withered hand stop him from showing up at the church. And this is unbelievable because we live in an era where people will cancel their whole church experience if they get a hangnail, if they find a run in their stocking, if they can't find their matching sock or their favorite church song doesn't play on the radio before they leave the house or they get caught by too many red lights because that must be an obvious sign that God wants me to turn around and go back home and get into bed when I have all of my limbs and all of my digits and all of my mental faculties and they're all in working order and but I'm so spiritually disconnected that I would allow some cold coffee to keep me from making it to the synagogue, to the church, to the Lord and worship the Prince of Peace and the Lord of Lords. But if Jesus, the creator of the universe, Jesus, who is Alpha and Omega, Jesus, who is the maintainer and sustainer of the whole cosmos. If he made it his holy habit to hell upon the house of the Lord, surely you ain't too good. You're not so righteous. You're not so prayed up, so biblically astute, erudite, and educated that you can pass on worship because you think you have church, that, that you think you can have church at home all by yourself. Listen, how arrogant, how ignorant, how crazy for you to surpass another opportunity to come before the presence of God. How crazy to pass on another obligation to gather together as the church to gather at the church, to gather to have church, to, and to be the church, and to worship the God of the church who established and founded the church with his own blood. Yes, Jesus suffered, bled, and died for the church. Jesus raised on Sunday morning for the church. And one of these old days, he promised to come back and get the church, and when he comes, he wants to find his church without spot, without wrinkle, and without blemish. And I don't know about you, but that's not the Sunday I want to be missing from the church. That's not the Sunday I want to be playing bedside Baptist. That's not the Sunday I want to be laying around in my PJs, streaming streaming it on Facebook Live. But that's the Sunday. I want to be in His presence. I want to be in the sanctuary. I want to be lifting up holy hands, lifting up my voice in praise to our God. That's the Sunday. I want to enter into His gates with thanksgiving, enter into His courts with praise and be thankful unto Him. May I tell you why? I want to bless his name because I 
the Lord was good. And on Tuesday, the Lord was good. And when I woke up on Wednesday, the Lord was good. I thought I was going to have a terrible Thursday, but the Lord was good. When I was praying over my fish on Friday, the Lord was good. And when I stepped out Saturday night, the Lord was good. And when I stood up and stepped up in the sanctuary and mounted the pulpit round about 12, 15, 12, 20, I was able to tell the congregation that this is the day that the Lord has made. And on this day, because I woke up, because I made it in church, because I was in my right mind, I have to say the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endures to all generations. That's the Sunday. I want to hear the brethren singing, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That's the Sunday. I want to hear the antiphonal frame. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. All I'm trying to say is the man showed up. He did what he could do in spite of what he could not do. He, he showed up on service in the sanctuary on that Sabbath. But there was also some scribes and Pharisees in the church. They showed up not to give glory to God, not to put some respect on the Savior's name, not even to learn and sit at the feet of the master teacher. But they had a meeting before the church meeting. And they decided they would attempt to sabotage the Savior by seeing if he would, if he would say it was okay to heal on the Sabbath. If he said yes, they wanted to try and indict him for heresy, try and indict him for unlawful Sabbath day practices. The only problem was they were trying to mix up the words of the word and get the word to stumble over his own words. But they didn't know in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In other words, if you don't get out of here trying to trip up your word with his own word, and Jesus turns around and asks a question that rendered them silent. He shut their lips and mouths, and in my mind, he dropped the mic. He asked, is it better to do good or evil on the Sabbath? Is it better to do good or to destroy? The inference is, if you have the ability to do good and you choose not to do good, you are causing more harm than good. You are being destructive when somebody's future is on the line. It is always lawful to do good. It is always necessary to do good. We will make up excuses. We will find reasons not to do good. When we, we will blame other people and circumstances for not doing good. We can blame the time, the day, the weather, or even the fact that they did you wrong or never have done anything good so you don't have to do anything good for them. But you know what? None of that matters. Uh, where's Malcolm X when you need him? You ought to do good by any means necessary. Look around for people. Look for reasons. Look for opportunities to do good. Go out of your way. Find people who could stand some good to be done in their lives. Go into the hedges and the highways. 
disturb the peace, upset the apple cart, irritate the status quo, annoy the people going about the regular way. And when they ask, why are you messing with me? Tell them you look like you could use some good in your life. Because doing good is always a good thing to do and it's always the right thing to do. And one thing I've discovered that has stuck with me all my years is you never lose helping other people. You will never do good and come up on the short end of the stick. Again, that's why I like rolling with Jesus. That's why I try to stand and stay on his promises because if Jesus doesn't do anything else, he, Jesus was known for showing up and looking for people and a good reason to do good. Tell your neighbor, that's a good reason to show up for church. That's why Jesus is my rock. That's why I roll with the master. The reason I know I can when people say I can is because Jesus keeps showing up in unexpected places I never ever expected. It's, it's good that Jesus shows up at church. Obviously, church is important to Jesus. I'm glad he shows up here and meets us here, but this ain't the only place Jesus shows up. Just this week, uh, if you go and ask somebody, Jesus showed up at a couple of hospitals just like me, but he but unlike me, he shows up at both hospitals at the same time. Jesus will show up at the bank when your credit is suspect. Jesus will show up at the courtroom when you don't have enough evidence to clear your name. And Jesus will even show up at your house and the White House. And if you don't think Jesus visits the White House, I want you to try and imagine just how much worse things would be if he never stopped by the White House every now and then. I, I bring this point up because Jesus keeps showing up for church even though he's already had some bad experiences at the church. So it was surprising. Uh, you didn't expect to see Jesus this particular Sunday because of all the things that happened on the previous Sundays. Uh, because you know how we do it. If we have one bad experience at church, we won't even give God a second chance. But on first Sunday, if you read through the book of Luke, Jesus was rejected in Nazareth because he says no prophet has honor in his hometown. On the second Sunday, if you will, Jesus had to curve and swerve his own countrymen so they wouldn't throw him off a cliff. On the third Sunday, he had to fight a demon in Capernaum. On the fourth Sunday, they stopped him in a cornfield because Jesus and his disciples were picking corn and eating it right off the stalk on a Sabbath. In other words, Jesus had to argue with some corny dudes about eating corn in a cornfield on his way to the church. But Jesus still made it to the house of the Lord. May I tell you why? Because Jesus likes hanging around people who don't have it all together. Like, don't we say that all the time? Everybody has something. But when we say it, we're usually talking about y'all and we're rarely talking about all. Isn't that interesting? People with all kinds of sins attempt to segregate themselves from other people who have different sins. People who are messed up try to minimize their sin and maximize everybody else's sins. But on any given Sunday, when you show up in the house of the Lord, you're going to have some blind 
and some cripple, and some crazy. You're going to have tax collectors, prostitutes, and sinners. You're going to have adulterers and fornicators. And this should give you both license and liberty to show up with what you got, with your jacked up self, with your toe up from the flow up, beat up self. You never, because you never know when Jesus is going to meet you and have mercy on your heart. When he's going to highlight your hurt and heal, work, heal you where you're broken. Jesus shows up because not only because church is important, Jesus shows up because you are important. He's been arguing all along in his ministry that you are more important than any animal on old McDonald's farm. That you, being the best of God's creation, deserve more attention and respect than your dog and your cat and your cow and your goat and your sheep and your bird or your fish. And it's crazy, but some folk, not anybody listening tonight, but some folk will go on vacation, drive by a whole village of homeless folk, put their dog in a dog hotel where you have a dog day at the spa while they're on vacation. But Jesus values more, values you more than your dog. Today might be your day. So don't miss church. Bring you and your ailment. Bring you and your disability. Bring you and your disease to the house of the Lord. Because Jesus shows up at unexpected times and unexpected places just to do what you never expected. I can handle it secondly because Jesus doesn't just do the impossible, Jesus does the unimaginable. Uh, with all the medical advancements, it is possible for a paralyzed hand to be treated and healed. But even in the 21st century, the best doctors in all the land are unable to restore a dead, withered, dried, paralyzed hand with a local atrophy and restore it back to its original state. At best, you can hope for an amputation and a prosthetic to be placed where your hand used to be. That's another reason to stay close to Jesus. That's another way to stay in contact and communication with the Creator because you never know when God will get tired of you not being able to give 100% of 100% because you've been doing the best you can with less than He gave you. You've been doing the best you can just with whatever you had left. But how much more can you do, could you, could you do, with all of your digits, with all of your mind, with all of your heart? Jesus doesn't just do the unimpossible. I said he does the unimaginable. He restores the man's hand to its original state. And the good news is, what he can do for the human man, the same thing he can do for the human hand. He can restore you back to your original state. In an age and an era where people are getting canceled on social media and in real life, when church people would rather throw people away who seem to be no good, it's good news to know we serve a God who is in the restoration business. A God who can take old withered lives, old withered dreams, old dried up relationships, even old withered hearts and minds and restore them to their original state. Come on, do I have a witness 
it to its original state. And this, my brothers and sisters, gives me hope today knowing there are parts of my life that God wants to use for his glory and for my good. If I can stretch it out and give what's hurting me and what's diseased in my life and turn it over to Jesus, he can take the stuff that I've virtually killed and put my life and put life and vitality back into it. And it's one thing for God to do the impossible because at least that's something I may have thought about. But Jesus does the unimaginable. That's the things I never thought about. Those are the things I could never ever fathom. And he does it in front of the very folk who wouldn't spit on you if they saw you on fire. He doesn't just do the impossible. He does the unimaginable. Do I have a witness? But I've held you too long, so finally I need to tell somebody Jesus doesn't just uh, heal the man, but the goal of Jesus in every situation is to make the man whole. Jesus shows up and he does what no one else is able or willing to do. They were willing to use the man to try and trap Jesus. But they were not willing to help the man to try and make him better. They did nothing to help provide the man uh, with the tools and the skills so he could provide for his family. They did nothing to help protect the man or to build up his dignity. They did nothing to make him feel like a man, even if he had to be a man with one hand. But here comes Jesus, and Jesus restores more than the man's limb. He restores the man's life. He restores not just a hand, but he restores the man's right hand, the hand that the people of that day assumed to be the hand of power. That's the hand that is restored to show that the man was not only healed, but that the man was made whole. He could resume all of his normal activities. He could do all of the work that he wanted to do. He could still now make a living and now provide for his family. He could now play with his children. He could now hold and hug his wife. And what I like about it is he didn't let his disability disable him from focusing on Jesus. He didn't allow his disease uh, to keep him from looking for a healing from the master. So why would Jesus, uh, I'm done, ask a man, a man with a withered hand to stretch it out even though he knew he couldn't do exactly what Jesus asked. Remember, the man's hand was dried up. The man's hand was paralyzed. The man's hand was disabled. The man's hand was withered. He is able to do what he can. He's able to stand up. He can move where everybody can see. He can stretch out his arm with the dead hand dangling limp and lifeless at the end. I'm just trying to say at least he did what he could and you ought to do at least what you can and not allow what you cannot do to stop you from doing what you can do. And this was the end of Brother Mendez's message. He says not to focus on what you can't do and what you don't have, but to focus on what you can do and what you do have. I, I gotta go now, but I pray to God that he will bless us with folk in the church who are more focused on what can be done instead of folk who are always looking for why we can't do what we want to do. That's why Peter 
writes about this when he says, draw nigh to God. And God will draw nigh to you. I, I like the songwriter who says, all you have to do is take one step and my God, he'll do the rest. Uh, because Jesus uh, never asked us to do anything. He is not willing to help us. That he is not willing to do for us all together. That's why he can ask us to do things that we can't do on our own. That's why he told the man to take up your bed and walk. That's why he tells another the woman to go and sin no more. That's why Paul and, and, and admonishes us to work out your own salvation. Uh, that's why Jesus said, be ye holy, because I, I am holy. He tells the man in church, go ahead, stretch out your hand, because Jesus offers another opportunity for his man's natural disability of his hand to hook up with Jesus' supernatural ability of the nail-scarred hand. Jesus goes above and beyond and always does the extra. And he always hooks it up with the man's ordinary so he can do the extraordinary. He pulls him out of the pew so that everybody can see the powerful partnership on display when divinity hooks up with dust. Uh, I can handle it because Jesus is that interesting and not just in the part of me that's broken, but Jesus wants all of me to be made whole, to be made right, to be complete, even if he has to carry all the load. And even if Jesus has to do all the heavy lifting, even if Jesus has to pay the bulk of the bill, even if Jesus has to do all the fighting and win all the battles and endure all the suffering and endure all the shame, even if he has to do most of the work, you ought to be glad that we serve a God when the record is read. It will say me and Jesus, but we will testify that Jesus paid it all.